You're tuned into today's PIR live event, and I'm your host, Scott Jones. Our guest today is Dr. Craig Merritt. He's an associate professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering at Carleton University. Uh, Craig studies a number of different topics in materials engineering related to flight, in addition to renewable energy devices. So welcome to the PIR live event, Craig. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to welcome today's viewers who are watching the live stream. It's great to have you with us. And please do remember that if you have any questions during the half an hour today, you can tweet them out using the hashtag AskPIR. Uh, and please do include your name, school, or city so we can give you a shout out. So I look forward to getting to those questions in just a moment. But first, I'll turn it over to Craig to just tell us a bit about his background and a bit about his work. So go ahead, uh, Craig. Thank you. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm an aerospace engineer. Um, I went into, into engineering and aerospace in particular because of Star Trek. Uh, I was a big Star Trek fan as a kid and I actually wanted to build the, the Starship Enterprise. Uh, when I became an engineer, I realized that wasn't really possible right now, but I could help uh, with the foundation and training the next generation of engineers so that eventually we could get to the Starship Enterprise. What I do, um, I actually work on airplanes rather than, than spacecraft. And the main thing I work on right now is figuring out how long an airplane will last. Uh, now, up until recently, we've built airplanes out of metal. And metals behave in a very uh, predictable fashion. And for any aircraft that you see out in use right now, big passenger aircraft, they will usually last for about 25 to 30 years. However, some of our new aircraft, like the Boeing 787 and the new Airbus uh, A350 are about 50% composite. And these composite materials, it's basically a plastic that has fibers, kind of like threads as reinforcement. Plastics behave differently than metals and we don't quite know how long they'll last. So what I work on is how do we take a plastic airplane and predict how long we can use it. And this involves quite a bit of math. Um, so most of my work for the past couple of years looks a lot like uh, a math test, is I just go through and figure out a prediction mathematically. And since I am a professor, I do have students who work for me and they do all the experimental uh, work to prove and support the theory that I've come up with. So I have one student uh, who is a pilot and he flies a small airplane that is completely composite and he has a little flight data recorder that he takes with him and whenever he's doing maneuvers, like acrobatic maneuvers, he's recording information about the airplane and then we can use that information to help with our predictions. Uh, so it's a bit of computer work, bit of math work, and some hands-on in the field on airplanes. Now, as Scott mentioned, I also do renewable energy because at Carleton I teach in our renewable energy program. And there's actually an overlap between this sort of life prediction for plastic airplanes and wind turbines, because wind turbines are also made out of plastic composites. And we need to know how long a wind turbine blade will last before we have to send someone out to replace it. Uh, so there's a lot that goes on in, in engineering that has multiple applications. And all of it, ideally, is to help make the world a better place, make airplanes safer, last longer, and provide energy that's clean to support Ontario and uh, the rest of the world. So I think this is a good time to switch over to questions. Um, sure. Uh, so that's that's super interesting. Um, I'm I see. I just went quickly to your your web page here, and I see lots of lots of big words that I'm sure lots of people don't understand. Um, Aeroservo viscoelasticity. 
uh, unsteady aerodynamics. Does this all have to do with what you were just talking about, seeing how long airplanes will last? Yes, yeah, so aero servo viscoelasticity is the more technical title for the work. Um, but how long airplanes last is the, the, the easier way of saying it, less of a mouthful. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so you talked about uh, your, your students um, actually doing the experiments themselves. Um, do you have a lab where you, you set up the airplane models or, or how do you do that part of the work? All right, so when, we're, when we do small model testing, uh, it's actually a little bit bigger than this little toy, um, we do have wind tunnels. Um, unfortunately, my camera is sort of fixed to my computer, otherwise I'd take you down to our, our wind tunnel lab. Um, mm -hmm. But in the wind tunnel, we, we have a model of the airplane, and this is where the flight tests data comes in, because we collect all this data on a few flight tests, and then we can recreate it in the wind tunnel and repeat it over and over again to see, well, what happens over time if the airplane keeps doing the same maneuver. Uh, it's not something we can test in real life because we have to pay for the fuel and gas can be expensive for airplanes. Right, right. okay. Um, can you tell us, so you said you were you were interested in, in Star Trek as a kid and that's kind of what, what spurned your interest, but um, how, how exactly did you follow that through to your current um, career? Um, did you, was it flying for the first time maybe, or have you always had an interest in flying? Or uh, Yeah, I always had an interest in, in flying um, when I was, I guess, in grade eight and, or nine, I got into building paper airplanes quite a bit and flying them inside the my parents' house. Um, I know my mom wasn't all that pleased when I'd crashed the airplanes into things, but uh, they, they were quite supportive overall. Uh, and when I got to choosing my undergrad program, like at the end of high school, I decided to go into engineering um, and pick aerospace, again thinking, hey, I, you know, maybe I can do something space program related. But during the four years of my undergrad, I realized that right now, all of our space applications tend to be satellites, and satellites are really just a box. They're, they're not, they're, they're technically challenging, but they're, they weren't that interesting to me. And I found that airplanes are more interesting because similar to the Enterprise, you're moving people around and they got to go to new places and experience new challenges and have fun events. So that sort of transferred me my interest more to airplanes and how to build better airplanes. Uh, after my bachelor's degree, I went on and did a master's and PhD. And that's where I became more focused on, well, we're switching to composites. That's the new big material. What does that mean for how our new aircraft will behave and how can we design a better aircraft using composites to the best of their abilities? Because right now we tend to treat composites like metals. And it's a very conservative approach. Um, we don't push the envelope enough with, with composites. Um, so it, it's the Department of, of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering though, right? Um, so from, I guess, from the mechanical side, you're you're interested in putting these things together and testing out new materials and incorporating them and then doing the math and seeing how they fit together. Is that right? Or yes. So on like the since the department is both mechanical and aerospace, we have about thirty five professors here. So uh, there are some who only work in the mechanical engineering field. That's a very broad field. So they cover everything from how to design and build better boats, boats and even just a better chair on a boat that's going at a high speed because it bounces a lot, to how do we build a simulator to train pilots uh, in all kinds of maneuvers. So some of my colleagues have built the simulator that looks like a giant hamster ball and it can spin upside down. You can actually do a barrel roll in an aircraft inside the simulator. So mechanical engineering touches a, a 
in a way much broader area than aerospace. And it also gets into more on the renewable energy side because we have some of my colleagues work on nuclear energy and how to design better uh, nuclear power plants, better pipelines, uh, reduce emissions. So it's a very big, exciting field. Right, right. Uh, so we got a few questions coming through on right. Twitter here. Um, so one is simply, what is the most interesting discovery you have made? What is the most interesting discovery that I have made? Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Uh, I think the m most interesting one uh, has to be that there is a theoretical limit to how long we can use a composite aircraft. Uh, the reason why this is interesting is that a lot of aircraft manufacturers have stated that oh, a composite aircraft has an unlimited life. That's actually in their sales brochures. Um, so to find out just from the math that there is in fact a limit and that there's a hard limit uh, is a useful result so that we can sort of update this literature and have an idea of just how long could we use an airplane assuming normal operation and we don't do something silly with it. <laughs> so, so when you say uh, composite, you just mean a, a combination of, of two or more metals? Is, is that the idea? Or? Uh, no, it's a, a combination of a plastic. Um, so any, even just like coffee cup lid uh, with a fiber inside. Actually, I do have an example here. Um, so hopefully the camera can pick this up. Um, yeah. So this is a type of fiberglass. So the, the brown portion, it looks just like a, a woven piece of fabric but it has an epoxy or a glue infused throughout the material so it makes it rigid. And then inside we have this blue foam which acts as a spacer. And it's a very lightweight piece, but this is a composite material. Now metals, if you put two metals together, uh, it's an alloy, um, but we don't formally call it a composite because metals, since we're we use metals much earlier and for longer, have their own nomenclature. Composites we tend to look at more as plastics. I see. Okay. Um, so Khalid Wu asks, um, and I think we kind of talked about this, but how many years of education did you need to become an aerospace engineer? All right. Quite so, a few, right? yeah, quite a few. It, since I became a professor that required additional years. Um, a lot of my friends after undergrad, so undergrad is usually four to five years. Um, and most of my friends actually went off and worked in industry. Um, so for example, one, one of my friends, she now works uh, with a company that simulates parts for the International Space Station. So after her five years of undergrad, then she went off immediately into industry and is now working on really cool projects involving the space station. She's done ones for uh, ship Navy simulators. So very cool. Um, another friend uh, went off and worked and now works in an airline. Um, he looks after uh, starting out the maintenance issues. Uh, to become a professor, then you have usually an additional six to seven years after undergrad just to do your master's and PhD. Um, if you add it all up, um, and I had to go through grade 13 in Ontario, it's something ridiculous for the number of years in school, and I don't like to think about it sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's certainly a very exciting and, and constantly evolving field, right? Um, so you're, you're constantly pushing, pushing the boundaries, you've got new materials to work with. Um, the, so you must have taken lots of lots of different types of courses in university, right? So it stretched from math to, to I don't know, at learning about the atmosphere. Um, I'm wondering, it also has to do with how, as much about the plane as it has to do with the, the air itself and the fluids, right? And how that works together with the, the plane? Yeah. Um, what, when we learn about uh, fluids, um, it's a little more isolated than the entire atmosphere. We're just interested in how does the air flow around the airplane in the immediate vicinity of the airplane. 
Um, we actually don't learn very much about the overall atmosphere, like how winds are generated. That's uh, a different field of geophysics. Um, now, if you go into renewable energy, you do spend a lot of time learning about the wind and how the wind is developed and how it changes over different land masses. Because if you're trying to figure out where to put your wind farm, you need to know what will likely be the windiest parts in a country. Uh, so renewable energy does spend a lot more time on how does the overall atmosphere work and models of the atmosphere and also how does the atmosphere interact with the ocean um, and you get all these sorts of neat interactions and, uh, and it all helps to build better wind turbines. Right, right. Uh, so I guess continuing with uh, how things are, are moving going forward in the research aspect, um, how, how generally do you see air travel changing in say the next 10 to 20 years? Uh, so in the next 10 to 20 years, you probably won't see too much of a change in terms of aircraft. Um, because it, it takes about 10 years to design an airplane. Uh, that's before you even start building it. Uh, so the, the Boeing 787 and the Airbus A380 are the two biggest airplanes that have come out in the past couple of years. So they started design work on that just before the millennium change. And they will be in service for the next 30 years, roughly. Uh, so you'll see some retirement of older airplanes, like the Boeing 7, 747, that very famous aircraft that sort of popularized jet travel, uh, is probably going to be retired over the next 10 years. Um, what you'll see more is, or you'll see more changes on the interior of it, an airplane. Because although we keep an airplane in service for 30 years, we always update the interior. Uh, so you'll see better lighting. Um, what they're doing, experimenting with now is how to change the lighting inside the passenger cabin to help the passengers adapt to the new location. Because jet lag is a big problem. It, you know, it, it makes passengers tired. So how can we play with the light levels to get them used to the hours at the new location. So if you're flying, let's say, from Toronto to London, England, it's about a six hour time difference. So over the course of the flight, they make you feel that it's getting later and later faster than it really is. Mm. So it sort of resets your internal clock so that when you arrive, you're more you're closer to being on London time. Right. Right. Oh, that's super interesting. Um, and uh, are there connections, and this may tie into one of the questions here on Twitter, but are there connections uh, directly between what you're doing with planes and, say, the, the more spacey side of things? Like I see behind you, and Zach Rivard asks the question that I've been wondering, too. What is that metal dish behind you? Looks kind of oh. futuristic. Uh, so that metal dish... So th this is actually a solar thermal collector for energy production. So oops, uh, what we do is we put a bottle of water in here and we can set this outside and it'll actually make the water boil. So it, this is a classroom model um, for my renewable energy course. There's a, it's not space related. <laughs> but we can answer about what's in the background. Right. Um, but certainly with, with your type of background, you can do lots of things. Like, as you said, you can work on planes, you can work on boats, as your colleague did, you can maybe use the space shuttle. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, it, it's definitely going into aerospace and, and mechanical engineering. They're both very flexible uh, degrees. He's in they can allow you to work just about anywhere. Um, a, some some of my, my more senior colleagues have worked on ev seemingly everything like, from gas turbine engines that you see on airplanes through to better car inlets like for like high performance sports cars to 
uh, better ship hull design. So it's engineering can take you anywhere you want. And you just have to have the motivation and the interest to, to pursue. Um, and you do have to be willing to, to learn on the fly. Uh, because sometimes you, you'll be hired by a company and they'll say, hey, we want you to work on this project and you might not know very much about that technology. And they're like, okay, you have you know a month to get caught up. So you're just reading all the time, watching things on online, different product videos from other companies, uh, maybe doing, watching lectures online from other professors teaching a course that's related to, let's say, boat hull design and you're, you're getting caught up. So engineering is very much about lifelong learning uh, to help do your job better because as an engineer, your priority is public safety. So you have to make sure you know all the ins and outs of what you're working on so that people are safe. Mm -hmm. um, so you're constantly uh, working with new and evolving materials, right? And um, I'm wondering, these things are going to start failing in different ways. And so you're going to have to test them in different ways. And how, how does that testing uh, change uh, over time? Like how you're testing before you put an aircraft into use? Uh, so when we're testing before an aircraft is in use versus when an aircraft is in use later. So the testing beforehand is usually we're testing individual components. So we take the airplane apart. We have all the little bits and pieces, everything from just like a nut and a bolt to uh, part of an aircraft frame. And we put these into our load machines, which basically just crush or pull on uh, aircraft components. And we record oh, how much force can they take? Or if we start vibrating or squeezing and pulling on a aircraft frame, repeatedly, how long will it last before it breaks? Uh, most of the time when we build a new airplane, the first two air aircraft that come off the assembly line, their whole job is to be tested until they break. Like they, they're never really flown or sold. They, they just sit there and take all kinds of abuse that we can dream up might happen to the airplane. And we test it out. If it survives, great. If it doesn't survive, then we go back and fix our design before we start selling aircraft to the public. <laughs> so it kind of goes from the ground up. You start component by component, and then you test the whole thing together. Yeah. And what we do more now is, if, before we even build anything, we do computer simulations. Right. And because simulating on a computer is really cheap compared to, to testing a physical object. But we still have to do the physical test because there's only so much a computer can tell us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, going back to Twitter here, we have a question from a student. Um, David Goal asks, um, do you have any tips for people planning to go into engineering? <laughs> All right. Uh, that's a good question, David. Uh, so to go into engineering, if you're like in high school, you'll need to take courses in uh, calculus, physics, uh, either chemistry or biology. Uh, and usually there's another science that's uh, thrown in there. Most engineering schools, that's what they look at for the prerequisites for admission to engineering. Um, you also want to be very interested in a particular technology. Let's say you're really into cars. Uh, the reason having interest is helpful is that once you get into engineering school, it is a lot of work. Um, what we tell our students uh, here is that they spend about 30 hours a week just in our lecture and lab and tutorial rooms. And there's usually another 20 hours a week worth of homework. So it's like a full-time job. And if you add that up, that's 50 hours. It's longer than a normal conventional work week. So being very interested and passionate about some technology helps you stay motivated during those times when you're just sitting there doing you know, math problems over and over again because you need the practice. It's a bit like soccer that you can't play a, a perfect soccer game unless you've been going to drills and 
uh, practicing with your coach and other teammates. So it's the same thing in, in engineering. It can be very boring sometimes just solving these problems over and over again. Um, so it helps to say, okay, I'm doing this because it will help me design the really cool car of the future. Right. And time management. That's the other thing. You have to be good at time management because you have 50 hours a week. There's a lot going on. Right. But you don't really need any sorts of special skills going into the uh, engineering degree, right? You pick them up as you need them. Yeah, you pick them up as, as you need them. Um, right now, like, just engineering as a whole, where it's going is that we want more people to come into to engineering uh, because we need more ideas and more viewpoints on how people use technology so that we can build better technology. Um, so I'm wondering if in the time left, you can talk to us a bit about, um, you, you said that you talk, you work a bit with um, renewable energy, right? Yes. And um, hydroelectric and wind energy devices, I see yes. on your webpage again. Uh, what, is, what exactly do you do on that side of things? All right, so, um, so this sort of came out of looking at aircraft. There's a, an unusual situation that can occur for some airplanes where as the airplane's flying along, if the airplane's going just the right speed, the wing starts to, to twist and, and flap. Now, when we design an airplane, we make sure that doesn't happen so passengers don't, won't have to worry about a wing flapping. But that flapping idea, we can take it and put it underwater. So as we have water flowing over this wing and the wing starts flapping, we can use that flapping motion to produce energy in an electric generator. Uh, so what I've been working on lately, uh, during this past summer, I had students are actually building these devices where we take an aircraft wing, stick it in one of our water tunnels and try to get the, the wing to flap back and forth. And we had it connected to a little electric generator and see how much we could produce. Um, so that's the unsteady aerodynamics side because normally aircraft wings tend to be straight. We don't let them flap around, but to produce energy, we want it to, to start flapping. Okay. Um, and so would this have, uh, is, just, is this just something that you wanted to, to see what would come out of it or, or where do you see that, that going? Uh, well, this actually has a, a very practical use because in... Canada, we've built a lot of hydroelectric power plants, very big ones, so again, northern BC, northern Quebec, Manitoba, um, and we sort of tapped all of the major rivers. But the Natural Resources Canada has identified that there's about 45,000 megawatts of untapped potential in smaller rivers that either have a very gradual slope, like they, you don't see it going over a waterfall, it just you know, sort of gradually runs all the way down to the ocean, but that water still has energy in it. So how can we extract some of that energy to replace, let's say, natural gas power plants? And the nice thing with using this flapping wing technology is that it's a very compact unit that we could just drop into the middle of a river and it flaps so slowly that it's not a risk to fish, like fish can maneuver around it, but we could still get some of the energy out of the water. So that's the bigger objective right. of, the, of the research is to try to use the, some of this 45,000 megawatt potential. Right. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so back to, to Twitter again. Um, so our students seem to be very interested in um, in uh, sort of your background and in the process of becoming an engineer. Um, Khalid Wu asks, uh, what what uh, were some of the main difficulties in your path to becoming an engineer? All right, uh, that, that's a good question, Khalid. Um, so the I'd say the the main challenge uh, was getting the right balance between schoolwork and hobbies, having something fun to do, because you, you don't want to work all the time. 
um, because it, it can exhaust you. Um, so trying to say, all right, I'm going to take a couple hours off and just play video games, games and say that, you know, that's okay. Like, I, you don't feel guilty for playing the, the, the video games, that you need that, that break. Um, and also just having time to talk to your friends because if you spend a lot of time looking at computer screens and uh, textbooks, you kind of lose that interpersonal connection. So it's helpful just to say, you know, on, on a given weekend, uh, let's get together and play board games. So very low tech uh, activity, but, you know, we get to talk to, to friends and relax. So that, that was the main challenge, just having, being okay with, you know, I'm going to take some time and just relax. It will make me feel better or overall, not quite exhausted. Uh, the other main challenge is about studying because there's a lot of final exams that you, and the exams are worth quite a bit in, in engineering. And there's a tendency to say, okay, I'm just going to leave all my studying until the week before the exams. But you have so much content to try to, to remember that sort of procrastinating and delaying it isn't a good idea. So just having the structure to say, all right, uh, I'm going to take 15 minutes and just review the, the lecture notes that I, I took this morning in class so that I save time later. Um, so those are the main, main challenges, having time to, to relax and also the organization so that studying didn't become a, a nightmare at the end of each term. Right. Yeah, it's all about balance, right? Uh, so I think we have, uh, I'll take the final question here, uh, and that's from uh, Zach Rivard at William McDonald School. Um, and his question is a very good one too. Um, he asks, um, how much of your research has been directed by uh, corporate policy or is it mostly self-directed? All right, um, so direction by corporate policy. Uh, so there's no, company coming in saying, all right, I want you to do this, this, and, and this. Um, the nice thing being a professor is that I can choose what I want to work on. Now, I do have to pay attention to what's going on in the overall field. Um, actually, in January, I'm flying off to a conference, and it's the world's biggest aerospace conference, to find out where companies see the aerospace industry going so that I have a sense of may where my research will fit into this overall trend. Uh, so that there isn't a direct corporate uh, person saying, do this, do that. Uh, but I do have to be aware of what's going on in the larger world of aerospace engineering. Okay. Does, it, does that go for, for government uh, policy too then? Uh, all right, so government policy is a little bit different. Um, so, like Carleton and most of the universities in Canada, they're public universities. Uh, so, we do respond somewhat to what goes on at the provincial level and the federal level. Um, so, like our renewable energy program here partly came about because Ontario wanted to push for more green energy. So we do respond to these government uh, policy ideas uh, about where they want the province or the country to go and how engineering can support that outcome. Because again, engineering is all about the public. That's our number one item on our code of ethics. So the government is the sort of direct representation of the public. So we have to listen to people from the government suggest. <laughs> right, right. Okay, um, well, unfortunately, I think that's that's actually all the time we have for today. Um, so thank you, Dr. Merritt, for taking the time to answer our questions and to share your expertise with us today. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for tuning in online and for sending in your questions over Twitter. Uh, just a bit of a, a pitch for our, our next event, which will be after the, the Christmas break. Um, when on January 14th, we'll be talking, talking with Dr. Graydon Raymer from Nipissing University, 
who will be talking about his research in exercise physiology and heart health. So that will be one to tune in for. Um, so happy holidays, everyone. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Merritt. You're welcome. And talk to you next time. Bye-bye.